Thanks very much, uh, Pippa. And um, as Pippa mentioned, I am organising a, a workshop on the legal regulation of parties for uh, for the upcoming APSA, APSA conference. So this is uh, this represents basically my first go at sinking my own research interests into party organisations with the sort of the, the broader parameters provide, uh, provided by the Electoral Integrity Project. So it's it's a, a paper that I hope to get as many comments and uh, criticisms from you as I can, and which is something that I'm going to keep developing throughout the course of the year in the lead up to this to this workshop. Um, today I'm really looking at whether or not there is a global normative standard for the uh, legal regulation of political parties. And uh, during the course of the presentation, I'm going to look at a, a number of things. Uh, first of all, the legal regulation of political parties as a field of scholarly inquiry that's been gaining increasing prominence in recent years. And it's a field that's moved well beyond the examination of specific electoral laws, which was the focus in the 60s and 70s, more to uh, ancillary laws which target party organisations. Um, I'm going to look at it from both the political science and legal perspectives uh, because I'm pretty much sitting in both camps in this field of research. One of the interesting things that, that people hinted at in her introduction is the staggering diversity of regulation across the globe for political parties. And one of the key issues for party scholars is how to understand and explain this diversity. Um, and then I'm going to sort of ask the broader question, well, who really cares about party organisation, legal regulation, and why is this important from an electoral, uh, electoral integrity perspective? Uh, can we uh, find evidence of a global standard for legal regulation of parties? And the evidence that I'm using uh, for that analysis comes from the Carter database of the obligations for, for democratic elections. Um, and then if we can't find any sort of uh, global agreement on the standards that should be applied to the regulation of parties, can we see uh, whether or not there are any sort of competing values at play? What might actually explain this? Are there normative democratic principles that conflict, that prohibit uh, us coming to any sort of consensus about how we ought to regulate parties? Um, and in that section of the presentation, I'm going to focus on a number of illustrative examples of constitutional jurisprudence. So looking at how individual nation states have regulated parties in their constitutions or mentioned them in their constitutions and the decisions of constitutional courts. Uh, which really sort of highlight and bring to the fore these competing democratic principles. And finally, I'm going to conclude with some of the challenges for legal regulation going into the future. Okay, uh, as people mentioned, parties are really important actors in elections. Um, they shape the contest before election day, um, at election day, and also after election day. For example, the rules that political parties adopt for the selection of their candidates um, fundamentally affect access to public office, access to political competition. The rules that they adopt for their internal organisation affect the ability of citizens to mobilise and participate in electoral politics. And finally, uh, the way in which political parties are financed determines their ability to communicate their ideas and their policies to the electorate, uh, as well as the resources upon which political parties are reliant. Um, but in turn, whilst the organisational choices parties make are really important, they are in fact by constrained and conditioned by uh, a body of diverse party law. And in understanding party law, I sort of adopt a fairly expansive definition. Uh, party law can be found in international agreements, it can be found in national constitutions, it can be found in laws that are labelled party laws, and this is a tendency of a lot of the existing scholarship on party law, just to sort of search out those laws that are called party laws. But I argue that that actually misses a lot of what is going on, because party laws can be found in electoral laws more generally, it can be found in administrative laws, and it can also be found in um, executive regulations, and also, really importantly, uh, judicial determinations. And the impact that these laws have on political organisations are really actually quite significant. And this is the, the part of the story that's interested party organisation scholars most recently. And I suppose we don't really need to look any further than uh, the example of United States primaries as evidence of this really, really uh, significant impact. Um, primaries were implemented by the US states quite purposefully at the beginning of the uh, 
the 20th century as a way to sort of crush party bosses and, um, and sort of uh, regulate party organisations. But as we can see, they've had a fundamental impact in structuring the nature of political parties in America, such that American parties have now been regarded as an exceptional party you know, type of organisation. Um, and they're seen as really different from political parties anywhere else. And all of this can be traced back to the regulatory decision that was made over 100 years ago. From a legal uh, perspective, as Pippa mentioned, political parties have generally been regarded as voluntary associations. So they've sort of stood outside of the scope of public law. They've been seen in the same group of organisations um, as sporting groups. So tennis clubs governed by the same sorts of principles. And this has really relied upon um, contractual agreements between party members and between party members and the party organisation itself. So the way in which parties have been conceived in, in law has really sort of revolved around this idea of private entities and contractual relationships. However, over time, uh, regulation has become more common across, across the globe. And also in legal scholarship, um, we see a slightly different way of thinking about political parties, where they've shifted from these voluntary organisations to public entities, where they play a, it's recognised that they play a significant and legitimate role in elections. And what this has done is that it's meant that parties' affairs have been subject to greater legal scrutiny. Courts have been more willing to get involved in internal disputes concerning political parties. And the way in which parties are dealt with by the law has shifted from this idea of enforcing contract to thinking, well, maybe if parties are public entities, they should be subject to the, the principles that, are, that we see in public law. So things like um, procedural fairness, uh, national, uh, natural justice, and also if they're mentioned in constitutions, their activities should be subject to the constitutional rights and freedoms that we see um, in many societies. So what we have is a shift there about how scholars are thinking, legal scholars are thinking about how parties ought to be dealt with. Um, and moving the, so the last chain in this development of thinking um, is shifting now from uh, regulating parties or conceptualising parties through the public law to doing so through a more general human rights scholarship. Okay? Because um, if, par if parties are public entities, they're subject to constitutional rights and freedoms, international law has been gaining increasing significance in constitutional jurisprudence, so then international law should therefore impact upon the activities of political parties. So it sort of makes sense to look at it from a human rights perspective, particularly when we're thinking about elections. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the previous work on political parties has highlighted their significant diversity in regulation uh, across, across the globe. And this is diversity in terms of uh, where the source of this regulation derives from. A lot of scholars have focused predominantly on constitutions and party laws, as I mentioned. Um, the sort of the, the type of regulation in terms of um, what outcomes it's meant to achieve, so whether it's prescriptive, proscriptive, permissive, or protective. And there are three main databases for information on party laws that we can go to. Um, each is a valuable source, but each is, is quite limited uh, in both uh, when it was last updated and its scope. So the National Democratic Institute database of party law, this was compiled by Ken Jander in 2005. Hasn't been updated since 2005, but covers around 150 democracies. Uh, most recently, Ingrid Van Beetsen and her team at Leiden have established a party law in modern Europe database, which is extremely comprehensive, uh, covers all of those different areas of party law that I mentioned, with the exception of judicial determinations, but the problem with that is that it's confined only to European democracies. And then finally, the International IDEA database um, on political finance is the most comprehensive in terms of its spread, covering 180 democracies. Uh, was updated last in 2012. The problem with that is that it only covers political finance regulation, which tells part of the story, but not the whole story of how we think about political parties. Now, thinking about why these sorts of why this diversity exists, um, regime type has been said to to play a, a role. Laurie Carnivan, in her 2007 study, uh, suggested that anti-democratic or non-democracies basically uh, use party law to oppress their opponents. 
um, democracies in transition will use party law to sort of mediate against lingering anti-democratic tendencies, whereas advanced democracies predominantly use party laws and regulation in the context of political finance. Um, historical development, as I'll uh, touch on when I talk about um, <laughs> the German basic law, plays a huge part. A country's history in terms of experiences with conflict, experiences with uh, previous authoritarian regimes, uh, are very significant in shaping the character of the regulation, um, as is institutional development and the distinction between common law and civil law uh, societies. It can also be the product of historical accident. Um, sometimes democracies will implement party laws which they think have got one effect, it'll end up having a completely uh, different effect or a much more far-reaching effect on the political system. And also, and, and very interestingly, I mean, party law and electoral law more generally uh, are important and contentious sources of law because they are inherently shaped by partisan interests. Those making the laws are those who will either benefit um, or uh, not benefit from, from those laws. So partisan interests come into play. Also, uh, and this is the um, contribution that I think the, part the paper tries to make, and this is something which isn't touched on that much in um, the current scholarship regarding party regulation, is that diversity is a product of the fact that there is no general agreement on certain aspects of political parties, okay? So we have a variety of competing democratic principles and values uh, that are at play, which the paper will seek to highlight. From an electoral integrity perspective, um, if we think about electoral integrity, and this is uh, adopting the definition that uh, is used by the, the project at the moment as a series of international conventions and global norms applying universally to all countries throughout uh, all stages of the electoral cycle, this provides a very transparent and agreed standard for, for evaluating elections and then in turn providing more concrete and specific policy prescriptions to improve the quality of elections. Um, but one of the things that's been noted by previous scholars is that whilst we can do this in the context of elections, uh, political finance has been one area where it's been quite difficult to establish these sorts of uh, democratic norms and conventions. And I would argue intuitively from my own work on parties that the same applies to the regulation of political parties and the intersection between parties um, and elections. So to move forward, um, what I ask is whether it's possible to discern any international norms uh, regarding the regulation of parties. And secondly, if these agreements don't exist, uh, can we identify a set of competing values and principles to at least sort of bring the source of these disagreements out into the open? Okay, now uh, the evidence that I use for establishing whether or not there are uh, global standards is, as I mentioned, the Carter Centre database uh, of obligations for democratic elections which uh, contains more than 150 international law documents. Now, these range from treaties uh, to other legal instruments to recommendations of treaty supervisory bodies to election handbooks and guidelines that are drafted by um, NGOs. And the database is qualitative, meaning that all of these different uh, laws are sort of basically taken, we, they take quotes from it and place them into the database. So you search by quote and then when you search it comes up with a, a sort of a slab of text. Um, and the material is searchable according to um, 10 different stages of the electoral process and it's colour coded to reveal and reflect the hierarchy of laws, um, international laws. And so what I did was basically conduct a very simple search uh, by the keywords political party and political parties across all aspects of the database. So I didn't necessarily limit it to certain stages of the electoral cycle, and so I was able to capture all of the different types of international laws that corresponded to political parties. Reporting the results of this, um, basically it's quite clear that there are extremely few binding international agreements that actually mention political parties, uh, and let alone provide any sort of substantive cues uh, for their regulation. And those few international agreements that exist basically flow from Article 25 of the ICCPR, which is that which provides for periodic um, elections guaranteeing the free expression and will of the electors. Um, and so from this, we find evidence that there's a general proposition that parties should be acknowledged as providing for the freedoms of political expression and political association that flow directly from that article of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
Um, and the evidence for this is found in um, interpretations um, by the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, as well as persuasive international documents issued by the OSCE um, and the Organization of American States, um, the CIS and the African Union. Now, the last three of these particular documents actually go further and suggest that we ought to, societies ought to provide for a pluralistic system of political parties because parties are seen in these documents as essential for representative democracies uh, and that political finance should be regulated. And this is what I've written here in the PowerPoint is very much taking the phrases from the specific documents. They don't go any, any further than this. So it really is very basic uh, principles. Uh, the interesting thing to note about this is uh, that the, with the exception of the OAS, the CIS uh, and the African Charter sort of highlight the fact that the societies that are more willing to recognise political parties are those that are undergoing periods of democratic transition. Um, very little sort of regulation stems from established democracies. <laughs> okay, so these are binding sources and persuasive sources. The largest source of international principles that I can discern um, comes from what is known as application level sources. So these are the handbooks and the guidelines that are issued by supranational organisations that are issued by NGOs. Um, and they're also, so they're sort of indicative of state practices that are happening, um, that are sort of establishing emergent norms rather than them being accepted norms. So the, the sort of the body of, of international principles that I'm going to talk about should be seen in this context, that it's not a binding or a persuasive uh, source of law here. Okay, so what I've done uh, here and what I've also done in the paper is sort of tried to distill a series of propositions about the state of international uh, agreement on the regulation of political parties that derives from these different documents. Um, the most common statements again flow from this interpretation of the ICCPR and this is what I spoke about previously in the CIS and the uh, African Union and the Organisation of American States documents um, is that individuals have the right to form, sorry about the typo there, and to join political parties and that political parties should enjoy status in domestic law and their legal activities should be equal um, under equal, sorry, protection of the law. Uh, I should note, however, that while this reflects this idea of an associational freedom, this is a qualified freedom, which I'll, uh, I'll sort of expand upon in a moment. Another sort of a normative proposition that, that comes out quite clearly in a majority of the documents is uh, the necessity to have party competition uh, and some element of pluralism. And this has basically got two tranches within the international documents. The first is that societies ought to have within them a minimum level of party competition. So that's, you know, presumably more than one political party in existence and contesting elections. The second tranche is that there should be competition between the various political parties. Um, and as a way of achieving both of these principles, which are in themselves interrelated, uh, a lot of the uh, international guidelines actually suggest party registration as a system or as a policy prescription in dealing with that. So this is why I've specifically mentioned this as the, next, as the next principle, that where it exists, the process of party registration should be open and inclusive. Um, and the phrase open and inclusive is something that I've used, uh, which is from the European Union Handbook on Elections. Uh, other phrases that crop up that uh, evoke similar ideas as that regulation, sorry, registration should not be too burdensome, uh, that it cannot exclude competitors, and that different mechanisms can be used in the process of party registration, which might include the imposition of particular organisational conditions upon political parties, um, minimum levels of activity in terms of fielding candidates or minimum levels of party membership. Um, or also thresholds uh, to access ballots, so vote, vote thresholds or uh, things like petitions of a number, of, uh, sorry, a minimum number of electors. But as I'll show in the next part of the presentation, articulating what exactly is party competition and how you achieve a legitimate, uh, what would 
you know, uh, what would uh, comprise a legitimate restriction on party competition is one of these sort of normative uh, conflicts that we come up against. Moving to um, state subsidies and political finance, uh, here there is very limited uh, agreement on the role of public funding of political um, political parties. The most vocal sort of region or, or body in this debate is the European Union. Um, Council of Europe and EU documents uh, suggest that states ought to provide public funding for their political parties, uh, predominantly as a way of achieving a level playing field for, for elections. Um, but there is some disagreement when states do provide funding for their political parties, uh, how this ought to be provided, on what basis. Uh, documents issued by the OSCE and the IPE tend to emphasise this idea of the level playing field that I spoke about, whereas uh, IDEA actually places a bit more emphasis upon equality of access to, to party subsidies rather than the equality of outcomes. So the two propositions that I can sort of discern from, from this area of party regulation is that it's in, in states' uh, abilities to provide financial and in-kind support for parties, but there's no general obligation to do so in the international uh, literature. And where provided state support should be consistent with the principles of equality. But the notion of equality is contested, whether that predominantly focuses on equality of outcome or equality of access. One principle that has actually finds a lot of agreement is uh, transparency. That's commonly accepted. Um, and that's not surprising because, in a way, transparency is one of the easiest regulations to place upon political parties. Um, and so the proposition here is that political parties should regularly declare details of assets, income and expenditures to an independent agency, uh, and this information should be publicly accessible. In terms of regulating uh, other parts of party finance, so the regulation of private sources of finance, um, again, this is an area where there isn't that much agreement. Uh, and there's a general consensus that states may restrict parties' income and expenditure, but such restrictions where they're applied should be reasonable and apply equally to all political parties. And that the appropriate regulatory mechanisms, so these are those which are specifically suggested by the international um, documents, uh, caps on donations, limits on expenditure, and bans on foreign donations. Uh, bans on donations from corporate sources and from unions are not mentioned as possibilities in uh, international law. Uh, and there's also no suggestion whatsoever about the limits, the appropriate limits on these donations um, and expenditure as well. One area where there is no mention really whatsoever of regulation is the internal organisation of political parties. The only uh, way or the only sort of area in which this appears is in the context of providing equal representation uh, for women. And it's done so in a context of affirmative action whereby states should support the activities of political parties um, to facilitate gender parity in candidate selection and equal access to public office. Um, that reflects um, international uh, treaty obligations and, as I said, is the only real area concerning intra-party regulation. Okay, so while we have some principles upon which you can find some sort of international agreement, there's still a lot in that um, where there are grey areas and where there are potentially conflicting principles. And so what I did, basically, is to look at um, uh, examples of how these conflicting principles are manifest in national constitutions and also national constitutional jurisprudence. Because looking at the international law by itself doesn't really tend to reveal what these uh, conflicting norms actually are. And so I've come up with five sorts of areas of conflict um, that I still think are ongoing that, that serve a real challenge for the legal regulation of political parties. And the first is fundamental. The first is, well, are political parties actually desirable as electoral actors. Um, and this is highlighted very, very clearly in the spread of constitutional recognition um, of political parties. From things like the German Basic Law, which recognises and regulates political parties in a great amount of detail and probably does so uh, as most comprehensively in, you know, in the world, 
um, through to things like the US Constitution, which makes no mention whatsoever of political parties. And returning to the debates around Confederation, this was entirely deliberate. Political parties at that time were regarded as divisive factions, were regarded as um, completely unnecessary and undesirable for democracy. Um, so they were very purposefully left out of the US Constitution. Uh, and the same situation occurred at the Federation debates in Australia. Uh, the framers of the Constitution contemplated parties, thought that yeah, they might spring into existence, sort of knew, knew about them, but said, no, we do not want them in our Constitution. As a reflection of democratic norms and principles, they have no place in this document. Uh, are these con concerns still relevant today? Well, I mean, parties now are really fundamentally important actors in elections, and they have been for the last hundred years. But with memberships declining, uh, and trust in political parties you know, going through the floor, um, they could still be seen as relevant concerns. To what extent should they be recognised as electoral actors and to what extent should they be supported? So this provides the first sort of point of, um, of disagreement with respect to the fundamental regulation of parties. The second is, is something I hinted at earlier, and this is the, uh, the conflict between associational freedoms and uh, the justifiable limitations that can be placed on those freedoms. Um, and the most practical question that arises here is, well, everybody has the right to join and to form a political party, but what sort of political parties can the state justifiably place bans upon? Um, and here, uh, several instances have occurred um, in Australia. I mean, the Communist Party was, the government attempted to ban the Communist Party in the 1950s. Um, Right-wing parties have been systematically banned in Germany throughout the 1990s. Um, more recently, Turkey has come before the, court, the European Court of Human Rights on many occasions for trying to ban communist and socialist parties. The approach that the courts have taken in this instance is something that I, can, I think we can learn from, and that is to recognise that there are these two competing principles at, at play here. Um, that there is a sort of, a, on one hand, a need to um, place limits upon political parties. On the other, there's the, the freedom of association. And what they have done is apply basically a proportionality test. So is the justification for these limitations proportionate to the greater pressing need to actually ban the association? So in doing so, they recognise the competing principles and basically balance them out in quite a, well, hopefully transparent and public way. Uh, the third... Um, point of contention is something I mentioned earlier as well, is well, how do we define what is party competition or what's appropriate party competition? How um, you know, open and competitive should elections be versus the very real possibility that the election might become fragmented and that voters might become confused? So in Australia, the controversies surrounding the Senate ballots are one excellent example of this. How, how many candidates or how many parties can we possibly have below the line um, until it just becomes too difficult for voters or impossible for voters to actually make a, a, a reasonable choice um, in, uh, in deciding who to, to vote for? Uh, there have been several cases that have dealt with uh, registration mechanisms, so this is the sort of practical aspect of this um, conflict. In Canada, the Supreme Court uh, invalidated a requirement that Canadian parties field 50 candidates at elections in order to qualify for, for registration. Um, given that you know, each party had to pay $1,000 for each candidate to contest the election, that would have cost parties $50,000, which was actually quite a, quite a high burden on political parties. Um, the state in this instance argued that it was necessary for the effectiveness of the electoral system, that it was necessary for the integrity of the finance regime, and that it was also necessary to achieve a viable outcome for the Canadian form of representative government, uh, which is a sort of a, a way of saying that we have a two-party system and we prefer a two-party system. And, you know, our regulations will quite purposefully try to limit the amount of party competition. Um, the court rejected this argument uh, and, and said that parties, no matter how large or small they are, play a, a valuable role in aggregating the preferences of citizens, and even if they don't manage to get, make it into Parliament, they put policy ideas on the agenda. So, in this instance, the court ruled in favour of open uh, competition, or more open competition than, than what the Parliament had provided for. 
Uh, as I mentioned, regulating internal organisation uh, again finds very little agreement in international law. And at the heart of this uh, conflict is the proposition of whether political parties ought to be seen as state entities or whether they should continue to be seen as voluntary associations that are essentially rooted in civil society. One aspect of this debate is the question as to whether political parties ought to be required to organise democratically. Um, the proposition that they should stems from the basic principle that well, if we live in a, a democratic system, it makes sense that political parties ought to reflect the values of that broader democratic system, that intra-party democracy will promote um, the ability of citizens to participate in the electoral process. And this is particularly salient in the context of candidate selection because it's such a fundamental part of what political parties do and that political recruitment through candidate selection is a, a, a very sort of significant part of parties' function in representative democracy. Um, again, here you could point to the United States' experience with party primaries, which was implemented um, as a way of trying to increase the inclusiveness of uh, political parties and the democratic process. Uh, the interesting thing about primaries being used in this particular way is that there's very little evidence that increasing the inclusiveness of the process actually produces more representative outcomes. Uh, in many cases, if you, uh, if you have a primary, you're more likely to get fewer women, you're more likely to get fewer minorities uh, represented in Parliament. So here we have this tension between whether we want equality of access or equality of outcome. Related to this is the issue of political parties and anti-discrimination law. And as I mentioned, um, promoting um, affirmative action measures for uh, increasing gender equality in candidate selection and representation one of the as aspects of international law that there is agreement on. Um, in the United Kingdom, this has been a very, very live issue because um, in the 1990s, uh, the Labour Party implemented all women shortlists as a way of trying to uh, achieve greater representation. This was challenged by a disgruntled male candidate who uh, basically said, well, this is actually a form of, of discrimination against men. And the tribunal that decided the case at the time agreed with him. Uh, he argued it on the basis that becoming a member of parliament was um, a, a job, essentially, and the whole thing should be decided according to employment law. And so uh, he couldn't be discriminated against for going for a job, he couldn't be discriminated against for uh, standing for pre-selection. Uh, the, it's also been um, invoked against the BNP as well, which has tried to restrict its party membership uh, to, I think the phrase was Indigenous Caucasians. Uh, and, you know, the BNP has, has changed its constitution to sort of water, water that provision down. But, you know, the question then arises, well, if anti-discrimination provisions are used to, um, you know, uh, regulate political parties like the BNP from discriminating against ethnic minorities, they then, by the same token, should be able to be used against uh, political parties that promote the representation of minorities, such as indigenous groups um, or <coughs> ethnic groups that restrict membership in the party based on those particular qualities. So there's sort of a, a sword that can be used against two types of groups with very differing sort of normative outcomes. And then finally, uh, the area in which there is significant uh, disagreement is, as I mentioned, the regulation of party financing. And here, the most sort of significant um, uh, conflict that arises, and again, US constitutional jurisprudence and the decisions of the Supreme Court highlight this very clearly, is that between the freedom of political expression uh, and the need for uh, regulation to achieve a level playing field through limiting contributions and limiting political expenditure. Uh, the US Supreme Court has basically ruled in favour of political expression every time. They've been historically a little bit more sympathetic towards limits on political contributions, um, but the recent decision uh, in the McCutcheon case sort of brings that into doubt. Um, that was where aggregate uh, limits on political uh, contributions were struck down by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, so they've basically said, no, nah, level playing field doesn't constitute uh, a, a valid reason to um, intrude upon freedoms of political expression. <coughs> Anti-corruption pro uh, provisions, and that actually has been seen as a legitimate um, uh, justification for limiting freedom of expression. 
But then the question becomes, well, what is, a, a, what is a justifiable way of regulating anti-corruption provisions? And this is where um, the recent um, uh, attempts by New South Wales to uh, impose basically um, bans on uh, unions um, aggregating their, their expenses with political parties um, uh, in the context of campaigning and also um, the laws which uh, prohibited uh, anybody from making a donation, anyone who wasn't on the electoral roll from making a, a political donation um, were invalidated very recently or at the end of last year by the High Court on the basis that those particular measures had absolutely no relationship whatsoever with anti-corruption uh, mechanisms and provisions. So that's a sort of a threshold question that arises there. Finally, um, it begs the question, well, who are the legitimate pro participants in the political process? So in the United States, um, Citizens United uh, upheld the right of corporations essentially to, uh, uh, to donate to uh, political parties. Um, in Canada, cor do donations from corporations uh, and unions are prohibited. And in Australia, as I mentioned earlier, uh, New South Wales legislation attempted to uh, prohibit donations from corporations and unions through this mechanism of a blanket prohibition of anybody who wasn't on the electoral roll donating, that was struck down. Um, developers in New South Wales, uh, still, that's still a prohibited donation, but that's simply because that didn't come under challenge in that, that most recent case. That could still potentially come under challenge. Okay, finally, just some, some brief conclusions. Um, so in contrast to the general conduct of elections, uh, the norms of political party regulation internationally are actually quite limited. And at the core of this disagreement, on one hand, you could also view it as diversity on the other, depending on the sort of spin you put on it, are uh, the competing conceptions of political parties as essentially either private entities or public entities. Um, at a most basic level, they're recognised and protected insofar as they facilitate associational and expressive freedoms. And regulation is much more accepted when it pertains to the electoral, the public functions of parties as opposed to private functions, hence uh, the, um, the avoidance of regulating the internal um, organisation of political parties. But there are certain clashes beyond these sort of basic propositions that can't be avoided. So the clash between freedoms of expression, freedoms of association versus the principles of equality of access and equality of outcome. And going forward and thinking about well, what relevance does this have for evaluating elections and developing sort of um, uh, standards by which we can evaluate uh, how parties are regulated or how they ought to be regulated, I think that in this instance rather than advocate universal policy prescriptions or try to find in each of these areas the right way forward, I think that you need to be able to build these competing values into the international standards because it's quite clear that there are quite definite parameters in this debate. Um, and I think that this is where we can learn from the human rights and constitutional jurisprudence that has been put forward by the various courts in explicitly recognising the competing principles that are at play in each of these different areas and then providing a, some sort of a way of balancing, systematically balancing those principles so in each case you can arrive at an acceptable outcome. So courts tend to do this retrospectively evaluating legislation but there's no reason why we can't say um, thinking about you know the party laws that are established in state X that they could be the spectrum with this particular principle on one side of the debate, that particular principle, and it's up really to the state to choose which principle it goes for, uh, and that we can sort of, you know, find a way of balancing those different uh, competing principles. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's wonderful. Come up to the bar now. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, uh, first thank you for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this uh, paper. I think that this is a very interesting paper dealing with an uh, extremely relevant issue and, um, and the paper I think that it makes a, a, a very important contribution. I think that it's clear that if we are able to identify a global standard, this is uh, extremely important for, for explaining many things in terms of 
political parties. So I, I think that the paper has uh, makes uh, two contributions. On the one hand, what the paper does is uh, what Robert Merton says uh, defines as establishing the phenomenon, that is showing that uh, the phenomena we want to explain really exist, because before starting to explain something, we have to show that the phenomena uh, are on the table. And second, the paper tries to identify to show that there is a global international standard. So I think that <coughs> the paper is, uh, fills a very clear gap, and, and I think that it is worth exploring this, uh, this concept. So my <coughs> comments, I will make <coughs> seven comments, I guess. And uh, my comments are much more suggestions mm -hmm. than uh, criticisms, I guess, but uh, not only uh, uh, suggestions. The first one, and uh, my first comment is that to some extent, um, I, I miss a deeper discussion about the implications of uh, the globalist, uh, the existence of global standards. In my view, there are two possible options when analyzing the, the topic. The first one is that if there is an international, if there are international standards, the, the, the first possible reason is that uh, there are similarities among countries simply because of efficiency. That is, there are some rules which are the best, the most efficient in the world. So if you prefer, there is a focal point in terms of institutional design. And the second option, and I think that the second one is even more interesting than the first one, is showing that there is a mechanism, there is a process of diffusion. I mean, once there is an international standard, <coughs> many countries uh, start to mimic what uh, some traditional democracies are doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, very related with this point, I think that we should make a distinction, and this is as a, as a yes to intuition, between a top-down process and a bottom-up process. The top-down process here I'm thinking in the case of traditional democracy. The idea is, okay, in the States, or in Australia, there are some standards, and it's possible to aggregate the standards in, in traditional democracies in order to observe regularities. And the other possibility is the bottom, is a, the, this would be the, the bottom up, sorry. The top-down approach would be saying, okay, there are some standards in some democracies, and these standards are applied to new democracies. So I think it's crucial making this distinction. I think that people have said something about this at the very beginning between traditional and new democracies. In terms of seeing that there is a process of learning, diffusion, blah, blah, blah. So uh, my third point is that uh, I think that before I starting to, to observe the, the, the empirical evidence, it would be very nice if we having a, a discussion about the key dimensions in the regulation of political parties. That is, based on the, on the literature of political parties, it would be very nice saying, okay, when we are talking about regulation of political parties, these are the four key dimensions, or five or two. Three. And then uh, let's see if these dimensions are uh, addressed uh, in uh, regulations. <coughs> because if not, the risk is that we are uh, defining the standards once we observe the regulation and not the other way around. And I think that this is a bit too, a bit too risky. Um, and very related again with this point, uh, I'm not entirely convinced about the conclusion in the sense that, in my view, in order to determine whether there is an international standard or not, we have to formulate a we need a null hypothesis. That is, what we have to observe in order to determine that there is an international standard. How many countries have to uh, sign this agreement? In which dimensions? So it's, it's again very risky uh, not having, I mean, we need a, uh, we have to specify a null hypothesis. That is, what we don't have to observe in order to conclude this or the other thing. Because if we don't have a very clear hypothesis or argument about this, about what we have to observe, the risk is that we can interpret whatever as an international standard. So in my view, it, it would be very helpful having a very clear argument about what we have to observe. And connected with this point, I think that maybe an empirical rule saying, I know that this is extremely difficult to do that, okay? I, I know. But an empirical rule saying, okay, that, uh, just for giving you an example, I mean, if uh, the 70% 70 70 of the countries in the world sign an agreement, we can say that there is a global standard. But imagine that only the 10% of countries in the world, I agree with a specific issue. Can we talk about uh, the international standard? 
I'm not sure. It's it's a it's a matter of interpretation. Uh, although I know that I said that it's very very difficult to do this. Uh, three more comments. Uh, obviously, uh, the natural comparison between the topic is uh, the concept of electoral integrity. So I understand that uh, the comparison is, is a good one and it's a very interesting comparison. However, when we are talking about electoral integrity, we are talking about states. And here we are talking about uh, private organizations. So can, are we talking about exactly the same? Can we uh, use the concept of electoral integrity without making any change as a model to follow? I'm not sure about that at this point. Uh, uh, next point. Uh, on page three, <coughs> uh, there is an argument about international laws. Uh, the, the words are international, public international law signals that the states have accepted and obligated themselves to certain standards of behavior. So, uh, not sure to what extent we can we can uh, conclude here. There is that there is a problem of endogeneity in the argument. The idea, the idea is that okay, uh, why some countries decide to sign the agreement and on other countries uh, countries not? So maybe uh, if we simply focus attention on uh, treatments or agreements, the problem is that only those uh, countries which are able to enforce uh, to follow the rules will sign the agreement. So maybe we should uh, take into account this idea. And finally, uh, my final comment is that. The paper is not very uh, reader friendly, to be honest. Uh, and for instance, there are no tables in the paper. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I think that you have wonderful data, and you have made a great effort to collect a very good data, but it can be uh, much more helpful for the reader, I mean, I mean for you, if you can present some tables summarizing uh, some and uh, that's all. Uh, again, I think that you are clearly feeling a uh, crucial gap in the literature, and many of the comments I have made are not, I have made that are, are not fair, but anyway, this is my role I have for discussing. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.